Nick and Matt have been working for, what, six weeks now? Is that about right? Yeah. Six weeks to develop this workshop for you. On the one hand, it's a chance for them to share a topic they're passionate about. They can have those who really have big life impact for your set of things and how to get back to the group. The other hand, it's also a chance for them to develop their facilitation skills and work on the workshop presentation. So, we're actually going to pass out the action cards down to all of you. We're going to take notes as we go. As long as it doesn't interrupt the flow of the workshop or the activities going on. Um, and feel free to give these two feedback because you're going to use this to take this forward. Um, it's my pleasure to let me know that both. simple strategy to create work-life balance and a four-step process to connect with kids and core members. So what are the seven habits? The seven habits as a book in the middle is one, be proactive, two, be your hand in mind, three, put the first things first, four, think win-win, five, the first out of ten, then get the so six, synergize, seven, start the song. We're not going to go over all these habits that we're taking us way too long to go over those and all of a sudden. So we just pick out one, two, three, five, 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 yeah, there are. Uh, go around the class, I see a woman probably like circa 1920, looking behind her sh shoulder, she looks like she's well dressed, maybe like something going on in the past. Okay. Alright. Can, can somebody else describe to me what they see? Over here? Everyone over here? Ian. Yeah. You know what? My name is Ian Brennan, or Doji. You see an old crone. And Nora. Nora, uh, where is. What is this on the young woman? That's a nose. That's a nose. What is this on the old woman? Yeah. That's her nose as well. It's a nose? What is this on the young woman, Nora? A necklace. What is this on the old woman? A mouth. A mouth. Alright, so are you guys starting to see that there's two pictures up here? Everybody see that? Yeah. Now, what we want to get across with this is. Power of paradigm. And what a paradigm is, is the way to view things. In this case, there's two paradigms you can do this as. You can do this as a young woman and an old woman. Sometimes you have to let go of what you know in order to see another perspective. So if you thought, thought, thought that line at the bottom was the old lady's mouth, there's no way you can see it as a young woman's necklace until you actually change that perspective. So what we wanted to do for the duration of this training is try and let go of what you think or what you know and See if you can come with that fresh perspective, or because otherwise there's no way that you'll be able to learn. Yeah, Aaron? What happens if you see it as both from like the get-go? What? If you see it as both from the get-go, yeah. that's actually what something we had just before. 
that means that you're able to see both paradigms, right? But you can't see both at the same time. You can't see like an old lady and a young woman, right? You have to let go of one in order to see the other. So the same thing still applies. You can't see an old lady and a young woman at the same time because you can't be like, oh, this is this is either a necklace or a map. It's not both. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So I need someone, please read for me. So PSTW that happens to be an honest projector. Anyone? Anyone at all? Nicole. Yeah. What if Nicole puts you for Such as your health, the education your students are receiving. 
outlined in that circle, out of that circle of influence, still in the circle of influence, are, are those things that you do not have control over. That would be your student's situation at home. Your student's situation at home. You have no control over that. So, what I want to show you on this next slide is where, how, is really demonstrates like how proactive you are already being, and like where do you spend most of your time in most of those two circles. If you spend most of your time worrying about what your uh, student's home life is at home, or whether the world's going to end in 2012, you're really losing all that time and energy you could spend thinking about and working on things you can influence, things you can change. Now on the left side, you can see the circle of influence is kind of expanding. I, don't want, I want to explain that to you. This is when you spend that energy affecting those things, um, having those effects where you can have effects, such as working with increasing the education, the education the student receives in the classroom. If you focus on that and focus your time and energy in that circle of influence, you might actually build a rapport with that student that they start talking about you at home with their parents. Their parents start to recognize who you are in their life. So all of a sudden, that circle, in that area of circle concern, where you had no influence over their home life at home, you now have influence over their life at home. You now have a bit of influence over their life. You spend your time and energy working with that student, and you can help them at home. You've now, you can now talk with their mother, their mother father, and say, well, they actually need a little bit more reading at home. They need to spend more time reading. And I would like it if you could make sure they're reading at home. So you've expanded your circle of influence. And that's where you need to spend most of your time. You need to spend most of your time working on that um, circle of and expanding it. So there's one thing we don't have control over. We do have control over that point between the stimulus and the response. We have that point where we can choose how are we going to respond to any given situation. We don't have control over what happens after we make that choice. We don't have control over our consequences. So if we chose to have that reactive mindset when we receive that occurrence that morning, how we treat those that are around us in that bad mood, that, those are the consequences we're going to receive. That's what we don't have control over. We don't know how they're going to treat us from that point on because we've already made our choice. On the opposing side, if you make that good, if, that good choice, the proactive choice, and say, you know what, this is really my fault, I take responsibility for my own life, you are then going to be able, to that. You are then going to be able, I'll just, you're then going to be able to have those positive um, interactions with your team and with your boss. So, I would now like to do an activity with you. I would like you to find partner next to you. And I would like you to practice the proactive reactive language I talked about at the beginning. Really, I want you to talk about a very difficult challenge you had to overcome a city here. And then I want your partner to correct you and record each time you make a reactive statement. Me and Matt are going to do a quick demonstration here. Would you like to tell me about a difficult challenge you've had at city here? Uh, well, go back to your right to the helpful language. Alright, so one thing that um, that um, I've had trouble with is maintaining the momentum I had at the beginning of the year towards the end of the year. Um, let me pause. So you had trouble. Okay. I want right, to one thing. reverse that. Okay. One one take one way. Sorry. Alright, so. I'm going, to, I'm going to rephrase that and say one thing that I've chosen to do is not go as hard towards the end of the year as I did at the beginning. Exactly. So it's correcting that statement, make sure they're talking in a positive, I take responsibility for my own life state. So we're going to give you two minutes, turn to a partner, we're going to try to explain that difficult challenge that we've had in city year, and they're going to correct us and have us on the flip side and say a proactive response. And then after two minutes, we'll reverse roll. Go ahead and do
So, can we please have some report back? Tell us like maybe something you noticed, something you learned, something you didn't. Anyone? Anyone at all? Yes. Sure, if I'm gonna succeed and I'm still scared, like it's really hard. And if I didn't have this 
who made the system with every part of my being, every every part of me that could want to do this, they do it, there's no way I can stick with this. Now let me move this down to something that you all are facing right now. Either next year or in a few years, you're all going to be entering the job market. And it's not a good time to be entering the job market right now. I'm sure you all have things you want to do. Are you sure about them? Are you sure about them with every party that you could possibly sure about them? Because if you're not, how are you going to stick with it? There's some party that's like, ah, maybe, maybe I want to do something else. How are you going to stick with it in this job market? That's why this is important. So how do we do this? How do we make this decision that's so important that we can't let go? First, I want to talk to you guys about the magical land of Kalamazoo. It's a parable. Um, Kalamazoo, in this situation, is not a uh, city in Michigan. So, the magical land of Kalamazoo, there was once a man in a village, and he was content, and he was happy, and he had a routine. And one day he heard an elder speaking about the magical land of Kalamazoo, on top of the tallest mountain that was right next to the village. So he started thinking, in this magical land of Kalamazoo, was magic and riches and a place where he could belong and everything he had ever wanted. So he started thinking about this for the next few months. He started really, really saying, all right, man, I want this. I want to get to that magical land of Kalamazoo. I want those magic and riches and the place where I belong. So one day, he was like, all right, this is it. I'm going to get to that magical land of Kalamazoo. So he marched up to the mountain, and he looked up at the magical land of Kalamazoo with the magic and riches, and then he looked at the entire mountain that he has to cross to get up to it. He said, you know what? I can't do this. I'm not ready. And he went back to his village where he had routine, and he had ease, and he had everything he had had for his whole life. So that night, he went to bed, and he started thinking about that mountain. He started thinking about how he could climb that mountain. He started thinking about, for the next few months, he started thinking about, you know what, maybe I can get up this mountain. You know what, I'm willing to do it. So he went back, and he marched back up the mountain, and he looked up the magical land of Kalamazoo, with his magical riches, and he started to climb. And he got a fifth of the way up, and he got a fourth of the way up, and he got a third of the way up, and then he looked up at all that big mountain, Dead climb, and that little bit, they would just have to go back. And he said, you know what, I'm okay with where I am now. I don't want to go through all that rest of that stuff. I'm tired. I'm going to go back to my place that I'm used to, it's comfortable, and it's everything I've been used to my whole life. So I went back to bed, and that night, he started thinking about, wait a second, am I really comfortable here? Is this really what I want for my life? And he started thinking about that for the next few months, and he got to the point where he was like, I can't stand being there anymore. I'm meant for bigger things. I'm meant for magic and riches and a place where I belong. So he went back up to the mountain. He looked up at the magical land of Kalamazoo and he was like, all right, I'm going to do it. So he got a fifth of the way up. And he got a fourth of the way up. And he got a third of the way up. He looked up all the big things that he had to go get there and the little distance where he go back. He went back to the village and he said, no way am I going back there. And he climbed to the mountain and he reached the magical land of Kalamazoo you got magic and riches and everything you ever want. So that is a magical land of Kalamazoo. So what does this teach you? What does this teach you? It teaches you that there's, everybody thinks there's one decision when you have a goal. I want this. I want to be a teacher when I get out of city year. I want my kid to pass the MCAS. But there's not. There's three decisions. There's I want. I want to achieve my goal. Two, I'm willing to do what it takes to get there. And three, I want to change where I am. If you don't make these three decisions, then something is going to stop you. Either when you see that big mountain, it's going to stop you. Maybe when you reach a stumbling block along the way, it's going to stop you. But if you don't make those three decisions, you're not there. And within these three decisions, there's these four dimensions. Logic, that's, does this decision make sense? Does it make sense to leave where I am? Does it make sense to go where my goal will take me? Emotions, does it feel good to leave where I am? and go where I go with me. Does it feel bad to be where I currently am? Values. Is this who I am? Is where I am, is where I am really me? Is it the right thing to do? Is what I'm going to achieve the right thing to do? Will it bring out the best in me? And reality. This is making sure that all those dimensions make sense. So, funny thing is, when, when you came to City Year, did you know about everything in City Year? Did you know about PT? Did you know about LDDs? Did you know about working in the classrooms? The people, what I found is that the people who know, who knew the most about the reality of what Sadir is going to be like, are the happiest out of the game. Right? So, 
I want to give you guys real quickly one practical thing you can do for each of these mentions. Logic. You can make a pros and cons list. What's good about changing? What's bad about changing? What will I lose? What will I gain? And then compare them. If you get if positives outweigh the negatives, good. Go for it. Motions. Do a future projection. Imagine where you're going to be, and I'm going to tell you when we get to reality how you figure out what that will be. Imagine exactly where you're going to be, and then the emotions, and then just read over it, right? Like, write, write in a paragraph. Like, you know, I'll have this, this, this in my life, and read over it. How do you feel? Do you feel good, or do you feel bad? If you feel good, go for it. Values. We've written, throughout uh, our time at Sydney, we've written mission statements, right? We've written some for IJ, we've written some for trainings. The mission statement is what you want your life to ultimately be about. So what you're going to do, you're going to go back to one of those mission statements, you're going to read over it. And then you're going to look at where you are now and say, does it match up? Then you're going to look at where your goal is and say, does it match up? The one that matches up more, go for it. Finally, reality. Two simple things. One, you're going to find somebody who's done your goal before. Somebody who's achieved what you want to achieve or something very similar. You're going to ask them, what's the best thing? What's the worst thing? How hard was it to get there? What were the biggest stumbling blocks along the way? Okay? The other thing you can do with this is the SWOT analysis. Figure out your strength that will help you achieve the goal, your weaknesses that will hinder you in achieving your goal, opportunities that will help you with the goal, and threats that will hinder you with the goal. And that will give you a more of an internal sense of how good a fit this goal is for you. So, you've now made that congruent decision. What comes next? The reality shift. Because this isn't just a dream, it's for real. <laughs> you can say, I want all that. I can say, I can say there's a million things I want that are good things. I want a million dollars. I want to make a difference in the world. I want to change the world. You can say, I want all you want. But until you say, I will, you're doing nothing, right? If you don't sit down and say, all right, here's what I want. Here's how I'm going to get there. I'm going to get all these steps in place. I'm actually ready to go ahead and do it. Put that stake in the ground. Nothing's going to happen. So how do you do this? How do you go ahead and put that stake in the ground and say, I will? Again, four dimensions. First, you have to plan. You have to start at the end, your vision, which we'll talk about in a second, all the way back to where you are now. Then you have to commit to that plan. You have to, this is where you go, this is the part where you say, I will. You have to somehow put that stake in the ground and make that shift from, this is something, you know, I really want this in my life too. I'm going to get this. You have to prepare. You have to get all those things in place and resources in place so that when you're ready to an active plan, you can go. And all of this has to be centered around a compelling vision that inspires passion. So let's go through each of these and give you one practical thing. Planning. Like I said, you're going to start at the end. You start your vision. You're going to start at the very end what you're going to achieve. You're going to ask, can I do this tomorrow? Can I just have all the stuff in my vision tomorrow? So, a kid, you know, I, I want this kid to pass the MCAS. Can he do, could he, if he took that MCAS tomorrow, could he pass it? No. What needs to happen first? Well, you probably need to get some math tutoring. So math tutoring is a step four. Can he get math tutoring tomorrow? No, I probably need to call his parents first. Okay, call his parents before. Can I call his parents tomorrow? Yes, I can. Right? I get the number to call tomorrow. So that's where you start. Shadow, what you can do tomorrow, and you work all the way up. And that's, and then there might be another line of that where it's like, you know, he also needs to get test tutoring in addition to math tutoring. So you can, you start at the end and then you go backwards along these different lines. That makes sense? Pretty simple. Next, you commit. The easiest way to commit, you're going to schedule something with somebody else. If you need to get to college parents tomorrow, then you are going to say, hey, you're going to talk to the teacher and say, hey, I need five minutes to talk to you tomorrow to get this kid's number. Now you've done two things. When they talk about commitments, you made a commitment to yourself, I'm going to meet the teacher, and you made a commitment to the teacher. Both you and another person can hold you to that. So easy. Just make, schedule something with someone else. Easy way to commit. Prepare. Two things, big things that every goal needs, most goals need. Time, money, or both. Time, what you're going to do, you're going to look at your schedule for the week. You're going to plan out at least a little bit of time every day where you can work on this goal. Whether it's five minutes, whether it's a half hour, at least a little bit of time every day to work on this goal. I'm not saying like every day you're going to be like, oh, when can I do this? You're going to do the same time every single week on that day for that goal. Money, set up a savings account. Name it after your goal. Take automatic withdrawals from your paycheck. 
You're not going to give yourself an option. You're not going to say, I really, I want to put money in my paycheck. You're going to say, I will. You're going to make it automatic withdrawals. <laughs> Finally, your vision. Three things that need to be included in your vision. What will I do? Experiences. What will I have? Physical, tangible objects. Who will I be? What kind of person will I be? You can do that in a lot of ways. You can make it a three-column three chart with you have be. You can do it kind of like you did the emotional thing. You can write a paragraph. You can write a day in the life. However you want to get across do have be, do that. And that vision must inspire passion. It must. Because if you don't have that passion, if you don't have that passion, you're not really committing. Right? You don't care. Next, effective action. Because otherwise, it's all just BS. This is where the fear comes in, right? Even if you committed to something, you made something else, there's still a little part of you that can say, you know, I can cancel on that VA. I don't really have to do this. But effective action is where you actually go ahead and do it. And that's scary. But if you don't do it, right, you can do you can do all the other steps, don't do this, and nothing will happen. If you do this step and don't do all the other steps, at least something will change. The world will change if you did it. So this is the most important step of the process. How do you do it? How do you take effective action? How do you minimize that fear so you can actually take action? Four dimensions. Action, that's actually taking those that one small next step, not worrying about the big, the big thing. Just saying, not saying when can I finish, when can I start? Motivation. That's anything that makes action easier, more efficient, or more desirable. Evaluation. That's making sure that your action, your motivation, your plan actually getting you closer to your goal. It's kind of correcting course and seeing if you're on the right track. It's all centered around the outcome. I'm not going to spend too much time on this um, outcome in this presentation because we don't have the time for it. So, action. One thing you can do. I, like, I have a simple acronym I to use for this. D-O-A-E-D. -E do it. Not bad, do it. Good, do it. Do one action every day. What that gives you is momentum. Momentum is one of the most effective ways I know to get rid of that fear. Because if you're in the habit of starting every single day, starting becomes less scary. Motivation. I'm going to give you another acronym. G-I-G-O. Gigo. It means two things. Garbage in, garbage out. And great inputs lead to great outputs. What does this mean? It means that if you put good things into yourself and into your life, you're going to take great actions. You're going to be able to take... Um, you're going to be able to, to output creatively. So an example, have good friends, read good books, eat good food, talk to good people, and good things will come out of your life. Get go. I have a whole wall that's just like great quotes and like pictures and stuff that I like to look at because of this. Great inputs with great outputs. Evaluation. You're going to sit down once a month, whether it's the first of every month, the first Friday of every month, just one time every month, and say, where am I? Where am I going? Am I on the right path? What's the one thing that I can do better that will most help me achieve my goal? Once a month. So, you've done all those things. Now, we're going to practice them. What we're going to do in just a second, we're going to split up. We have tables around the room for each team. You're going to use spaghetti and marshmallows to make one of three things. One, the ideal core member. Two is your dream house, and three is a replica of the Washington Memorial. You're going to have to first take two minutes to decide which option to take. Secondly, you're going to have to make a reality shift by planning exactly how you're going to do that. And third, you're going to take effective action and build it. Now, there will be prize for this. Me and Nick were thinking like a, a um, Core member, uh, what's it called? The Idealist Handbook signed by like Robbie and Charlie Rose, something like that. It's gonna be good. Whatever it is, it's gonna be good. And it'll go to that team. So if you want that, if you want the Idealist Handbook, we need to play with them first. But if you want it, um, if you want it, take this seriously. So what I'm gonna do? Go ahead, stand up, and find your find your team paper.
and they don't cost any bank. We're going to start out with no career decision. So here, up here is everything you can have. You have three choices of things to make. The idea of four member, your dream hat, your replica of the Washington Memorial. Here's what you can do for each dimension. For a reality, you can use swap maps. It's that strength of your team, weaknesses of your team, opportunities that will help you with this, and threats that will go against you. For a lot of you, you can make a total contract with each one of these. Promotion, you can do that emotional projection like I was talking about. And for values, you can look at your mission statement. What is your team like? How it do it? You're not allowed to open anything, touch anything yet. If you didn't touch it, stop. And I, um, anything that's not written down, we won't be able to grade. So write down all this stuff. You're going to have two minutes to decide which one you want to make. Ready? Begin. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. 
So we can touch the pasta, break the pasta. You can break the pasta whatever you want. You can't put any marginals on it. You can't take any marginals out. So you're going to have to do this. Ready? Again.
Because this is a personal process, 
But when you're going through it as a team, you really have to look at like, what does the team want versus what I want. So that, that is something that made it difficult, but it also could have made it easy because we've been with our teams for the entire year. So and somebody thought it was easy. Can I get, can I get Katie from you? Somebody thought it was easy? Yeah, Katie. Why, say that? Why was it easy? So BCE's yeah, yeah, vision and reality yeah, and their emotions are all tied towards building things. So they, the fact that this was something they really wanted, this actually was a good decision for them because they, they like building stuff. So it was, it was a really easy decision for them. With the Agassi. Alright, with the Agassi. So, let's talk about the reality shift. This is where we planned, we assigned roles. Did, um, who thought that was not helpful at all? No one? No, no one thought it wasn't helpful? That it was not helpful? Who thought it was helpful? Alright, if you, Sam, can I have a few words about why you thought it was helpful? Uh, I said it was helpful because everyone knew what they were supposed to be doing. Okay. So, not only knowing where you want to go, but knowing how you get there. And how did that, sorry, can you say that for one more second? Yeah. How did that play out when you actually went to take action and um, make it work? It works. Okay. <laughs> Alright, let's talk about action. Um, I want to talk about challenges. What, what problems did you run into after you made your plan that you didn't foresee? Anybody run, yeah? Um, I overestimated the structural capabilities of the materials, so I had like this really ambitious plan and didn't work out. Okay. And how did you how did you then evaluate and change your plan based on that? We we tried to fix it, but it just fell. Down. Okay. We didn't react it. We didn't. So we had five minutes. It's a really hard time to. It's really hard in that time, to obviously, for a course. Any other comments or concerns before we move on? Yeah, great. Okay. Yeah, I apologize for that. I should have been, like I said, I should have been much more clear in the direction. So I really apologize for that. Alright, so moving on. Great. So, once again, well, I please have someone with Jack and W up here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Setting our goals according to those rules. 
the third part is then scheduling your priorities, not prioritizing your schedule. Everyone's familiar with the infamous to-do list. You write up a list, this is what I need to do this week based on my goals, and hopefully I'll get done by Friday. I need to have it done by Friday. This is the wrong way to set up your schedule. Your schedule should not look like this. You typically end up on Friday scrambling to make each of these things happen. What you need to do is you need to schedule your priorities. If you need to have a schedule for your week, it tells you when you're going to be doing these things. When am I going to work on these specific projects to make them happen? When am I going to have the time to make this happen? If I have a to-do list, that's great. I can cross those off. But if I have a schedule that tells me where I'm going to do those and when I'm going to do those, then I know that they're going to be achieved. I'm going to have all that free time on Friday. I'm going to get to Friday, and I'm not going to be stressed out over a day. I'm all set. So again, that's what are my roles? What are my goals? And it's uh, scheduling your priorities, not prioritizing your schedule. And finally, it's just adapting daily. From day to day, you can have that schedule on the board, but we don't know when something spontaneous is going to come up. We don't know what's going to happen next. And we have to wake up each morning and remember, OK, so I'm actually not going to be able to help to give my brother that phone call at 6 o'clock. How can I adapt that to make it happen? Maybe I'll call him before work, wake him up early in the morning, really annoying. So just remember to adapt daily. That schedule will not always be perfect for you. So you have little sticky notes with you right now. I want you to take those out and put them in front of you. And I want, I want to challenge you to write down a role that you might have recently been neglecting in your life. For example, I would write down, my, as a brother, you know, I wasn't really familiar. I wasn't really paying attention to his birthday coming up. I actually him one daily. So I want you to challenge, challenge you to write down that, write down a role that you've been struggling with, and then write down a goal that's associated with that role. I want one role and goal for both your professional life and your personal life. There are two poster boards. When you're done writing that down, I want you to put it on the poster board corresponding. They're on both sides of the Civic Forum, written in my excellent handwriting. So please, by all means, go do that. Then get up, put it back, and get back to your seats. And we'll talk about it. Sorry, I had a question. Um, so, if you were looking at what was going on the post it now, I want you to write down a role that you might have been struggling with or neglecting within your life, whether it be like um, a sibling, a um, son or daughter, whether it be like a best friend. Find that role that you've been neglecting in your life, and then write down a goal associated with that role. And then I want, for each of you, I want one that involves your personal life and one that involves your professional life. And I'd like, love for you to place them on the two post boards in the room and then return to your seats. Does anyone have any questions about that? Is that, is that clear enough?
because I think it's really important. Before I walk in another person's moccasins, I must take off my own. This is what we talked about a little bit in the beginning of the presentation with those pictures. I want to talk about how it supplies communication. First, we're going to watch a little clip. Disclaimer, there may be some language used in this clip. Um, so whenever you hear yelling, if you're not comfortable with that, I would cover your ears. Second thing I want to say, I want you to get a little background on what's happening here. Um, this character in here, the teenager you're going to see, his name is Dwayne. And Dwayne set a goal to become a pilot. Right? So he has worked for that goal. He took a vow of silence and hasn't spoken since he decided to become a pilot. Every morning he says push-ups, he is really into this goal, but what he failed to take into account was a simple reality. And you're gonna find out, see this clip, what happens when he actually finds out that reality, which is, again, an important part of the career decision. So, we're gonna show you what happens when he finds out the reality, finds out the reality that he failed to take into Family. No, you're not my family. 
Okay, I don't want to be your family. I hate you fucking people. I hate you! Divorce? Bankrupt? Suicide? You fucking losers! You losers! No, please just leave me here, Mom. Okay, please. So this, let's talk about the uncle. The uncle is the um, the adult you saw that was in the back with Wayne. Does anybody remember how that how this conversation went with Wayne? What happened? Set this whole thing up. Anyone? Jess. into this that he can't even like begin to process that. And the first thing the uncle says is, you can't fly jets if you're colorblind. Which is exactly the wrong thing to say. That's exactly the reality he's trying to avoid at that moment. It's exactly the wrong thing to say. Right? Not so he first understands. Just being blunt, openly, setting, setting off that hook. So whether he could have prevented it, who knows. But he definitely didn't help out by, with what he said. All right. Let's talk about the father. Let's talk about his reaction. Good or bad? Anyone? <laughs> Come on, you guys. Seriously. Yeah, Ty. Uh, the type of black and the father was just concerned about the time. He wanted to go. He was, he was like, yeah. And then he was like, oh, yeah. He was just concerned about the time. So he wasn't actually like, he was helping to do something. Right. Not taking off his moccasins, right? Not taking off his moccasins. Before putting on Dwayne's accents. 
All right, let's talk about the mother. Good or bad, anyone? Yeah, Erica. Right, okay, I, I love that you picked up on that. So I show this to a lot of people, and very few people pick up on that. The word sympathy there, we're gonna talk about in a second the difference between sympathy and empathy, okay? Finally, Valley. Yeah, Ronaldo. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, Alan. I'm not. My, my mistake. The connection between She didn't have to say anything, right? <coughs> right. And and she didn't just go up right and like, oh, I know you mean this hug, right? She didn't just run up and do that. She kind of went up to him. She kind of she kind of crouched up next to him. It's okay. Kind of slowly put her arm around him, checking if that's what he actually needed. And then when he was kind of confirmed that by not by not giving her that negative reaction, then she went ahead and went a little further. So let's talk about the steps of this. This is called empathic listening, it's a skill. First thing, like Ronaldo just said, is stop talking. Shut up for one second. Don't try to give advice. Don't try to say, I'm sorry. Erica said, I'm sorry, sympathy, right? I'm sorry is sympathy. Do you think he's just had his dreams crushed? Do you think he cares at all how she feels? He's just had his dreams crushed? Absolutely not. Right? So we just stop talking and allow that person to express themselves. Give them that opportunity and that space to do that. Next, empathy and understanding. I understand where you're coming from. I get it, okay. You're upset. You just lost the dream that you've been working on for a year. That if Violet could have talked when she was just kind of standing there before she went up to him. Uh, sorry, oh, if could have talked before she went up to him. That's kind of what she would have been saying, right? Like, I understand, I get it. There's nothing I can really say to change that. Empathy and understanding. Clarify and validate. This is when she was kind of crouching next to him, getting up to him, kind of figuring out what do you need. This is about the intent. Why are they showing this behavior? What is the need behind it? What do they need? And then kind of clarifying, is it what you need? Is that actually what you need? Finally, act or don't. She went and she actually rested his head on his shoulder, right? She actually gave him what he needed. But if she hadn't felt comfortable with that, is that one who she was, if she didn't have that relationship with him? So you don't have to do that. You don't have to be the person who always is fulfilling needs for others. You don't have to be, you know, you don't have to put your own needs, someone else's needs in front of yours. It's your choice whether once you figure out what they need, you actually go ahead and fulfill that need. So that's how to be, how to understand. Let's talk about how to be understood. This is how to make sure that people really understand what you're saying. People really connect with you. There's three parts of this. Ethos, integrity, and credibility. Pathos which is empathy, and logos is logic. So ethos is like being real. You see somebody who's real, somebody who, who puts themselves out there, who's just like, that's them. Like, that's not a front, that's not anything, that's just them. They're real. That's ethos. Pathos, it's about taking what you think, what you, what you know, your wants and desires, and expressing those in a way that the other person understands. So you kind of meet in the middle of that. Logos logic. It's about being clear and precise, giving reasons why. How does this look like in your service? Let's talk about the wrong way to do this. So a student has their head down on the desk, kind of just uh, not really engaged in the lesson. Let's talk about the wrong way to do this. I do this all the time. All the time. Okay, uh, could, you please, uh, could you please put your head up? No, 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 go away. All right, I'm, I'm going to check in a few minutes. I really need to figure that out. Go, go away a few minutes later. See them? No. Seriously, they can't put their head up? Come on, you, you really need to get your head up. You're missing a lot of the lesson here. It's really important. Okay, walk away. It's okay. I'm okay. So go over, they still like that. All right, it's time to put your head up. This is your warning. Next time, your car is going to be changed. Either they put their head up, 
or a change of card, right? The wrong way to do it. I would seek first to be understood before I understood, try to understand. Let's talk about the right way to do this. Hey, you look tired, man. You were late, late night last night? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alright. Alright, that's okay. Um, Alright, so, what I did first, seek first to understand, right? Empathize and accept. You look tired. You had a late late last night. Empathize and accept. I understand. Yeah, I get tired too sometimes. It's okay. Now, you need some time to rest, huh? Clarify and validate. Is this what you need? Yeah, I'm really tired. I need some time to rest. All right. Now it's time to act. We're going to use ethos, pathos, and logos. Okay, I understand. You need some time to rest. Pathos. I understand. You need some time to rest. What I'm going to need you to do, please, could you just do it for me? Ethos, who you are. I know it's going to be really hard. Pathos. Understand it. But what I need you to do is put your head up because that way the teacher will know that you're paying attention. I know you're paying attention, but you can't show that without looking up. Logos. Logic. Reasons why. Tell you what, this works way better than the other way. So, what we're going to do now, we're going to give you a quick review, and then we're going to take questions. We have like a minute. Okay. So, the first time we learn is being proactive. This is when you have a stimulus and a response kind of spot in the middle where you make the decision, do I take responsibility for my own life? Or do I put blame on the environment for that? Alright, begin with the end in mind. This is a goal setting process. Congruent decisions with logic, emotions, values, and reality. The reality shift with plan, commit, prepare, centered around your vision. And then the effective action with action, motivation, and evaluation centered around your outcome. But first things first, this is your roles, your goals, scheduling your priorities, um, scheduling your priorities, not prioritizing your schedule, and then just adapting daily. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. This is about the four step process for listening. Stop talking, emphasize and accept, clarify and validate and act, and the three ways to express yourself. Ethos, uh, pathos, and logos. You're done? That's it. That's all we have for you guys.